Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, which by my count is the fourth of the Mills and Reef Talking IP sessions. Those that have been to them before will be familiar with the format. Um, we're very fortunate um, to be joined today by Victor Fu, who's the IP counsel at Joseph Joseph, um, the, um, the household goods, the kitchenware company. You'll see some more about Joseph Joseph shortly. Um, and joining us on the panel today with Victor is Claire O'Brien, who's our head of IP litigation. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll hear from Victor about some of his experience about enforcing Joseph Joseph's rights against online infringers. And Claire will talk about a couple of case studies we've had of um, unusual and interesting um, enforcement issues online. And we'll also get the opportunity to perhaps talk a little bit about how we think uh, things are developing, how the pandemic has affected online enforcement and what the future might look like. So let's kick off. Victor, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it, it's very kind of you to spare your time um, to, to share your, your knowledge with us. Um, but before we talk about IP enforcement, can you tell us a little bit about Joseph Joseph, the business, um, what your products are, what the company's ethos is and, and, and some of the history of the business? Certainly. Thank you, Mark, for the intro. And uh, morning or evening to everyone. I hear there's a Malaysian, a couple of Malaysian attendees. So uh, thank you for staying up late. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, the business uh, is, was started by twin brothers, Anthony and Richard Joseph, uh, who worked at their granddad's glass factory initially in Birmingham. And then when they graduated, uh, they founded Joseph Joseph Kitchenware uh, back in 2003. So initially doing contemporary glassware, uh, like clocks with uh, colorful faces, bowls, worktop savers, that sort of thing. Uh, they had their first big break with a product called Chop to Pot, which handily I've got here from my kitchen, <laughs> which is a foldable chopping board. So you basically chop, chop, and then to the pot. So there you go. Um, so that launched uh, them into a uh, full kitchenware, uh, functional, playful kitchenware, uh, which over time has been expanded now to homeswares covering um, the laundry room, the bathroom, some other rooms, which is uh, under wraps at the moment. But basically, we try to cover the whole um, the home environment now. Um, so that's pretty much it. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and, and what's what's your role at Joseph Joseph? Um, how did you get there? Um, and, and what was it that led you to work for Joseph Joseph? Certainly. So um, I'm the IP counsel for Joseph Joseph, as you mentioned. Uh, I was a solicitor in Malaysia, uh, and then I came to the UK, uh, and my first role here was with BP, uh, where I was involved in the change of name project from British Petroleum to uh, what they have now, the BP and the flower logo. Um, so um, then I was in private practice briefly with Linklaters, uh, before joining uh, GSK Pharmaceuticals, uh, doing a bit of IP transactional work. Um, and then just before Joseph Joseph, I was with Richmond, uh, doing brand protection for luxury goods. Um, so yeah, I've been, uh, I've been caught many names in my career, Mark, um, from drug pusher to oil scumbag, you name it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And tell us a little bit then about the, the, the current product line of, of Joseph Joseph. Where, where do you do your business? And, and as IP counsel, what's your approach to IP protection? Our main market uh, is, uh, it used to be UK, but now increasingly it's overseas now. I think America, uh, both North and South and China are now increasingly becoming important. So it has grown globally uh, over the last decade or so. Um, and um, the approach that I've taken for, for Joseph Joseph is, um, I've had to adapt it because Joseph Joseph is a SME uh, with fairly limited budget compared to the, uh, to the companies that I used to work for. So I have to do a lot more of the heavy lifting myself. Um, I can't be instructing external lawyers, you know, whenever a case comes up. So uh, it's that sort of approach, basically, uh, on, a, uh, on a holistic, I would say, approach, which is the same as the big companies, uh, but on a smaller budget, basically. Uh, now, by holistic, I mean uh, it's from conception, as you can see on the screen, uh, through registration and maintenance to enforcement, uh, and I'll elaborate on each of them. Uh, so conception, by that I mean, um, now firstly, conception isn't really talked about much when we talk about uh, brand protection, which is a shame because it's quite an important part of it. Um, 
by conception, I mean when the first when the designers first talk about the ideas that they have for a product, or and they share the ideas uh, when they're sharing the ideas with like prototype makers, uh, factory engineers who produces the product, uh, focus groups, uh, members of the public that we bring into the office to show the products and test out the uh, USBs of the products, and also customers uh, who uh, in most cases want to uh, order few seasons in advance. For example, the likes of uh, John Lewis, they would be ordering now for season, uh, season spring, summer 2023, for example. So we have to show them very early on. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the key thing here is, while those discussions are taking place, you have to ensure that they are kept confidential. Uh, so disclosures are only made with NDAs in place and to ensure the records uh, the designer's plans, sketches, cat files, uh, all those are kept out of sight from visitors. Um, so there's a lot of do's and don'ts that I have to remind the colleagues in my office uh, on that. Uh, so, uh, now, registration. So this will be your filings at natural registries, the EU IPOs or YPOs. Um, so the thing is, I suppose to ensure coverage fits with the commercial plans or sales forecast. Uh, some products work better uh, in certain countries than others. Um, the brothers, he, they like to remind us of when they, were, when they first started peddling the products overseas. Um, they brought their cheese graters uh, over to South, uh, to, 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 to Asia Pacific, um, you know, eager to sell it to the Japanese and the Koreans and the Chinese. Uh, uh, turns out when they showed it to the customers or protect uh, potential customers, um, they don't eat cheese as much as the Western countries. So basically it is a lesson learned and they have to, since they have learned to adapt um, the products to the country. And we have actually, uh, in terms of filing registrations, we have also adapted that. So we can cover more where we sell more and then less where it's not doing so well. Um, so I guess the others uh, are housekeeping once, uh, when, when you've got your registrations uh, in place, then to use it accordingly. Uh, making sure you put all your notices, you know, the TMs and the uh, Cs in circles and R in circles, that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of things involved with the packaging and everything. So we have to make sure everything's, uh, you know, properly marked uh, accordingly. Uh, and then ensure consistency and correct use by ourselves and our commercial partners. Um, so that is registration. And then maintenance essentially is just to keep whatever you've already registered going. And what we've done because of our limited budget is we will, uh, we will sort of review products that sell better and then we will keep the registrations for those and then we'll renew those and then anything that's not doing so well, uh, we will drop over time. Uh, and that helps with the cost savings. So um, then we go on to enforcement. So this is where basically we tackle infringers uh, from source to end seller and everyone, everyone in between, your wholesalers, middlemen, you know, housewife, college kids um, on eBay, that sort of thing. Um, the uh, approach is really multi-pronged and um, also we have to be uh, selective in our battles because there's so many, so many out there than our capacity or budget can handle. So we have to choose and pick our battles. Uh, so what you have seen or what you can see on the screen now is an example, uh, pretty, pretty clever example, actually. Um, they've, as you can see, they've pretty much replicated everything uh, sans the, the name. Uh, so credit to them for actually making some effort on, that, on, the, on, the, on the mark itself, uh, which is uh, quite clever. Uh, so, as I said, multi-pronged. So we will tackle them online. Uh, this will be your platforms, domain names, uh, domains, uh, social media, and then uh, offline we will deal with like the one-pound shops, your bargain shops, or in independent stores. Uh, sometimes even re uh, reputable chain stores. They will have their own brand products which mimic our products. So, yeah, even upmarket ones. Um, and sometimes it could be even our customers who are actually selling some of these copies alongside the genuine product. So it's a, quite a challenging, well, delicate situation when you have to deal with that sort of uh, situation. Uh, also, we will enforce at trade shows which are relevant to our industry for FMCG. Uh, this will be 
uh, there's one in Chicago, one in Paris, and there's a major one in Canton, uh, China, which is the Canton Fair. And I would advise anyone who suspect or think they may not have a problem to yeah, pay a visit. Uh, it's on two, twice a year in Canton. Uh, yeah, they, they've, got, they've got everything. It's like probably four times the size of Excel. Excel. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. huge. I've, I've been actually, and it, the, the scale of it is absolutely yeah, mind blowing. It's just crazy. If you think you don't have a problem, go <laughs> there. You, I think you will see a problem. <laughs> Well, that's, 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 that's a smaller one in Yiwu, which is more uh, um, Dao market, which is uh, not as upmarket as the Guangzhou one. But there you go. Fantastic. Yeah. And talk about the online infringements. Then, do you, I mean, do you come across many, and and where do you find them? Which are the platforms that are a particular problem for you? Sure. Um, well, China is the source of most evil for us. So the usual Alibaba, DHgate. Uh, these are the wholesalers, hub, um, suppliers where you actually do bulk orders and they have MOQs, which is the minimum order quantity. So this comes in the thousands. You either order 1,000, 10,000, that sort of thing. So these are hardcore infringers for us. Uh, and then you have the sort of, sort of the retail consumer sites, which is the Taobao, Tmall, AliExpress. Yeah, so this would be all the individual sellers. Um, still quite substantial, I mean, because the sheer volume of it. And the problem with these sort of sellers is, um, there's a thing with uh, what they call death by a thousand pricks. If you don't deal with them over time, you get pricked a thousand times, you still bleed the same as a big knife gash wound. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, it is, it is something that we have to go after each time. Um, then you have the same uh, sort of sites in Japan and South Korea. I think it's Rakuten in Japan and Neva in Korea. And then you have uh, in Southeast Asia, you have Lazada, and then you have Bukalapa, which is an Indonesian site. Um, in the EU and the US, you have the usual Amazon, eBay, and then Wish. Uh, there's an Allegro site in Poland. And in, this is a huge one in Latin America, which is Mercado Libre. Uh, so yeah, plenty of them out there. Um, okay. Social media sites as well. So now they're full of fake offerings. Uh, your Facebooks, Instagrams, Pinterest. So yeah, it's not just Kim Kardashians. You find all sorts of things on offer there. <laughs> And, and so do you actively monitor websites for infringement or, or do you just deal with them on an ad hoc basis as, as they're brought to your attention or come to your attention? It's a mix of both, Mark. Uh, so it can be reported to me by colleagues out there in our sales offices. It can be from the law firms such as you, uh, you, you guys. Uh, it can be uh, concerned mops, uh, members of the public, I call them. And then um, JJ fans, sometimes they will tell us they're outraged that, you know, copies are being sold and... Um, yeah. So there you've got an example of a chopping board, uh, which is uh, quite heavily copied. And I think in the next slides, there you go. All sorts of variations uh, that you can find. Uh, so yeah, uh, Amazon, eBay, I will monitor periodically myself uh, to get a feel for what's out there. Uh, it's good to see what is actually being copied and then you kind of get the trends and sometimes competitive activity as well. Uh, we also use a uh, brand detection uh, platform uh, called Red Points, uh, and they do the sort of wholesale picking up of the, of the listings on the various platforms uh, that I don't cover. And then I'll just go through them and tell them what to take down, basically. Excellent. And what's your, what's your strategy then for dealing with infringements? Do, do you have an escalation procedure? Do you go up through steps? Um, and uh, what are they? Um, do you use the Amazon brand registry? Do you, do you use takedown notices? How about business to business requests, domain name complaints, or just threats of proceedings? Which, which, are, which are your preferred means of dealing with infringements? Yeah. Um, I have a matrix for like cases being reported, uh, sort of to capture the information needed and uh, gives a measure of the seriousness of this case. So. Uh, the, 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 the parameters are basically like quantity um, of the product and the visibility uh, and whether the product is a bestseller or if it's something that we're going to be discontinuing so I wouldn't be so concerned um, and also the cost to enforce uh, sometimes I can 
uh, deal with them directly, or sometimes I had to use uh, external lawyers. Uh, for example, in France or in China, you need bailiffs to actually get the evidence. So mm. those things I would have to involve external lawyers. Um, so in the form of uh, I, the, the actions taken will be, uh, for example, take down notices. These will be fairly familiar to a lot of, uh, your, uh, a lot of the people in the audience. Uh, the Amazon reg brand registry, as you mentioned, uh, and then they have a separate IP infringement reporting tool, uh, which is very useful. Uh, also, we've got Vero, which is eBay. Uh, and then, as I said, Redpoints, they do all the bulk taking downs for us as well. Um, for domains and social media, I deal with myself or sometimes if, it, if it's a tricky case, I involve uh, an agency called NetMonitor, you may have heard of him, uh, who does uh, targeted enforcement uh, with the help of PIPCU. Uh, for those not familiar, this is the uh, police IP crime unit here in the UK. Or we will uh, do complaints to Google, uh, which is quite effective as well. Um, separate, uh, on other cases, I will send uh, cease and desist letters to mostly English-speaking countries, like parts of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. Sometimes I'll send them to non-English-speaking countries, depending on if it's a simple issue or, yeah, I just have to use local lawyers in those circumstances. Yeah, and every now and then we get uh, customs or trading standards uh, or their local consumer protection uh, equivalent. Um, for example, in China, it's the SAIC. Uh, so yeah. Okay, and, and, and how effective has your enforcement strategy been so far? So far, so good. Um, as I said, because of the limited budget, we have to pick our battles and there's always more fixed than what we can deal with. Uh, so it is, yeah, it's just a balance. And unfortunately, it's a whack-a-mole situation, which I, I'm sure is the same for a lot of your clients. Uh, it's basically trying to keep them under control and harass them enough so that they move on to some other product. <laughs> okay, at that point, I think we'll, we'll have our first poll. Um, so those in the audience who, who have these sort of issues, how effective have you found platform takedown procedures for combating uh, infringements and, and counterfeiting online? Um, there's your choice, very effective, moderately effective, not effective, or, or haven't you used them? Okay, that's a, that's a really interesting pattern I think we're seeing there. And, you know, the vast majority of people think that they're moderately effective, those that, that, is, that have used them, and, and one or two people very happy with the online, with the, these, these procedures, and, and, and a couple of people who've been unimpressed. And I guess that's um, going to depend on your, the experience of of individual cases but but interesting it seems they could it seems they certainly could be better because it would be nice to see a much larger very effective number there wouldn't it um victor does your strategy differ depending on where you're trying to enforce your rights do, do jurisdictional issues make a big difference to you it does mark um so we will for example in key markets we are a lot more active uh so we are we are searching for like infringers uh, in a more proactive way, uh, whereas other markets we are perhaps more reactive. Uh, also, in some markets, we get pressure from our distributors uh, and customers. So basically, they want us to clean up the market before they actually stock our products. So that will uh, give us an extra motivation, if we will, to do that. Um, China, as I said, is a source of all evil for our products. So we do a lot of what I call carpet bombing. We basically just, yeah, just try and hit as many as we can. And then in Europe is generally, we find uh, a more respectful of IP uh, in general. So the letters are a bit more polite. And uh, yeah. of course we're mindful of unjustified threats, um, counterclaims, so. <laughs> sure, and, 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 and moving back from, from IP enforcement slightly for a moment, how's, how's your business holding up during the pandemic? What changes in the way the business works have you seen? In particular, have you seen what I guess anecdotally we think a lot of people are seeing, which is an increase in online sales? Um, initially, uh, of course, I think sometime in March last year, there was a ma massive cliff drop and everyone was panicking. Uh, but things have since picked up. And um, I think for us, the fortunate thing is because everyone's stuck at home and everyone's doing more things at home, uh, being being a, a, you know, a vendor of um, homewares, I suppose is uh, very fortunate because there you have got a lot of people with free time and then doing a lot of things at home and they want a lot of kitchenware and 
you know, cooking a lot more healthy. So that helps us. And so we've seen a massive spike in terms of online sales. Uh, and that is actually making up for obviously the, des- the high streets that's been decimated. Uh, so a lot of our customers, your the John Lewis, your Debenhams, and things up, even Debenhams gone, I think. Um, so yeah, all of this basically has completely just dropped off and um, yeah, that's been picked up online. Okay. And have you seen, with that increase in online sales, have you seen a, a, a similar increase in online infringements during the pandemic? Uh, absolutely. Um, they've become a lot, I mean, just the sheer volume of it is quite scary. Um, and I think they, these guys are using bots just to set up multiple accounts, like, you know, very, very quickly, we're using different, different identities. And um, yeah, I mean, once they set, the problem we find is once they set up an ASIN listing on Amazon, it appears on every Amazon site globally. So all they need is just set up one and then they're selling it in like 20 different countries. Um, yeah, it is that sort of uh, 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 difference now. Sure. And the other, obviously, the other big topical issue that's affecting business is Brexit. Is that having a, an effect so far on the Joseph Joseph business? I guess it's, I suppose, same as everyone, is the administrative issues are starting to come up. Um, for example, we do a lot of deliveries, obviously, that, that becomes a problem when it's a customs uh, being held up. And then we do a lot of sample deliveries to our B2B customers. And then, you know, extra paperwork, labelling has to uh, uh, be tweaked now. And then website terms and conditions, uh, warehousing. Um, so yeah, all these bureaucratic and administrative work. And, um, and that's just on the commerce side. Uh, on the IP side, of course, same as everyone, we've got to do double coverage now, both UK and EU um, with extra cost and you know, administration. Uh, so yeah, and then over time, probably the laws are going to diverge that will, uh, I suppose, cause uncertainty in terms of IP rights. Yeah, and I think actually we're, we're, when we when we get to the towards the end of Claire's session, we'll probably end up talking about some of those areas where we might be seeing some divergence sooner rather than later. And, and finally, Victor, for you before we before we move on to Claire, um, where where are the biggest opportunities for for Joseph Joseph now, um, and and what are the biggest threats in the post Brexit, hopefully post pandemic world that we're we're moving towards? Um, I guess we're doing. I mean, the opportunities are online now, basically. Uh, so we do a lot more of collaborative uh, marketing campaigns with our uh, retailers. Uh, and then we are now doing a lot more loyalty programs, for example, which brings in a lot of, uh, brings in bulk orders and more regular uh, uh, custom, uh, basically. And then we're trying to uh, expand into different parts of the home, as I said, a new line of perhaps office products. So um, yeah, we're, 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 it's a challenge, but we're, we're prepared. Fantastic. Great. Well, Victor, if you hang on, I'm sure there'll be some questions for you when we get to the end. Um, so, Claire, Vic, Victor's mentioned some of the difficulties associated with identifying infringers on the internet. Um, and uh, I know that you had problems identifying an infringer in um, a case we had, which was relating to the sale of, of fake um, exam certificates on the internet. Do you, do you want to tell us a little bit about that case? Was a, was a, a yes, case study? yes. Thank- yeah, thanks, Mark, and thanks, Victor. Really interesting to hear about uh, your the, the business. And so we act uh, for for an organisation that presents the examination awarding bodies uh, like AQA or City and Guilds, and they, together with other clients, actually face the problem of um, third parties selling fake examination certificates uh, on the internet. And the problem with that is that those certificates often bear the trademarks of the awarding bodies and and those trademarks are used without consent. So that's trademark infringement. Um, And and they they clearly intend them to be understood as genuine certificates. So there's there's the element of fraud there or assisting in a fraud uh, because those uh, fake A-level or GCSE or City and Guild certificates can be used to obtain jobs that you wouldn't probably be able to access if you didn't have those qualifications. So... The um, pro- problem with them is that while the website is often in plain sight, it's not always apparent who the infringer is or who's behind them. And these infringers tend to go to great lengths to hide their identity. Um, often these websites are fronts for other a- illegal activities which aren't immediately apparent. So the, the first challenge we have is to find out who is actually responsible for those uh, sites. 
and what are the methods that you can use usually to, to, to identify those infringers um, and what investigations would you would you make before commencing an action? Yeah, well, there are a number of things you can do. The first thing we would do really is just to do a, a, a who is search to, to try and find out who owns the domain name. I mean, that was more useful in the past because um, prior to the introduction of the GDPR, you used to be able to plug a name in and get um, uh, and uh, identify who, who registered the domain. But um, those details are often uh, hidden behind a privacy setting now, so not uh, available. However, if it's a .co domain, you can file a data release uh, request form with Nominet uh, and ask them to reveal who the registrant is. They, they will do that if you're doing it for a kind of legal investigation, but it does have a drawback. Um, it, they also inform the registrant of the domain, uh, you know, that they have given these details. So it takes away the element of surprise, which is quite important in uh, contentious matters. Um, if you do have a name, you, uh, a, a reverse who is search is quite a good uh, tool as well, because you can see if the people, um, other, other domains that that particular person has registered. So you can see if they have form, if you like, in this type of activity. Uh, the website itself may have some useful information uh, in the about us section, terms and conditions or the privacy policy. And the other thing you can do is you can contact the host or the registrar of the domain and, and those details. Well, the registrar is often uh, available on the WHOIS search. And um, but we have found in our experience of contacting hosts and registrars that there's a wide variation in how helpful they are. Um, uh, sometimes they don't want to get involved at all, but sometimes if the host thinks that the activity going on is, in is, is IP infringement and in breach of their terms and conditions, they will take the website down. The problem with that, as Victor alluded to when he spoke, is that you end up in a, a game of whack-a-mole. So whilst one website may be taken down, they'll jump to another host and set up again. So it's, it's often not a, a permanent solution. Sure. And in this case to do with the exam certificates, yeah. what? What, what happened? Yeah, well, we were pretty sure it was a uh, .co.uk domain and that the defendant, well, it was a .co.uk domain, but we're pretty sure that the, the defendant was based in the, in the UK. Um, we made inquiries of the host and the registrar, um, but again, we, we ended up in the whack-a-mole game where the website was taken down, but it popped up again. So it was proving quite difficult to identify the infringer in this case. So we instructed an investigations agency uh, they turned up a few names uh, and addresses. At, um, we wrote to those uh, names and addresses, but the letters were either returned or, um, or just went unanswered. Um, so th they were false names. Um, so what we did next was take screenshots, gather some evidence, take screenshots of the pages on which the fake certificates were offered for sale on this website. And we decided to issue proceedings. In this particular case, there was an email address given on the website, a sales address, something, or, or you know, and it said uh, we applied. We asked the court whether we could uh, have permission to serve proceedings on that email address. And that that evidence capture process, how important is that? Would you say? Well, I think it's very important. And Victor was talking about some of the things that he did in order to do that too. So screenshots of the infringing products, um, these things change very quickly on the internet. So it's important to capture this evidence. Um, you can also do a track purchase so you can try and buy one of the infringing products to use as evidence. Um, and as Victor said, in relation to more wide scale infringement or counterfeiting activity, there are these companies who scour the Internet for uh, in, uh, counterfeits or infringements, such as Red Points or CSE Net Names or Clarivate CompuMark. And they provide these evidence capture services, which enables you to proceed with the case. OK. And when you've got that evidence, what are your options at that stage? Well, a lot uh, also, as Victor said, depends on the nature and the scale of infringement and the importance of the product to the IP owner and how resistant actually the infringer is to stopping its activities. That, that varies too. Some on receipt of a letter will stop straight away. Others are more uh, persistent uh, and also the IP owner's appetite for litigation. Um, you can see you can see whether the host or registrar, as I mentioned, is willing to help. But other avenues uh, you could try are perhaps um, filing a report with Action Fraud, which is a national fraud and cyber crime reporting centre, or trading standards. But both of those um, have limited budgets. Um, 
and are probably overwhelmed with workload, particularly at the moment we have noticed actually when making those reports, um, there seem to be a lot of online fraud during this, particularly during this pandemic, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, payment disruption methods are quite good fun. So if you can, um, if websites have um, Visa or MasterCard um, that you can you can use to pay for the products, you can contact those providers and, and ask them to try and disrupt uh, the payment methods to the website. So that's another way of going about it. And then obviously either send a letter of claim or uh, and ultimately issue proceedings. Okay. So in 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 this case, in the certificate case, you you didn't have. An address to write to you didn't have an identity um how did you go about issuing proceedings um and, and well, how did you describe the defendant in the claim if you didn't know who they were well that's a good question so we we did as i mentioned we did find an email address on the website so uh, um so we had that but that's all we had really and we did one of these kind of john doe type uh, arrangements whereby we identified the defendant as the personal person's trading from a website accessible at and then put the domain name or the person responsible for publishing the website at and again inserted the domain name because that's really all we had and we use that for the purposes of the claim form um, and the particulars of claim and the court granted our application to serve the proceedings on the email address we had found and so we did. We thought we'd serve the proceedings on the, you know, through the email address. And we think we thought we'd hear, hear nothing further and, and get a, a, and be able to apply for judgment in default. But uh, it didn't quite work out like that. So what happened? <laughs> well, um, well, uh, in, in terms of what we wanted to do, we were very clear um, we, we did actually hear from the person uh, on whom we served uh, the proceedings. Uh, it, we were very clear when serving the proceedings uh, on persons unknown what we wanted to achieve uh, with the client in terms of um, we wanted to stop the infringement and for the website to be taken down. And we thought that would be easier to achieve with um, a court order, because even if the defendant didn't comply with it, we thought we could use that to persuade the domain name authorities uh, to, to help. And, and also the publicity order was very um, important for our client to, to explain to the world, you know, that we're actually taking action in relation to these fake certificates uh, and um, to serve as a deterrent because there are so many of these sites. We thought it was really important to, to publicize that action was being taken. So um, we, we applied for the other remedies as well, but we were realistic about the chance of achieving those in terms of monetary reward or, or, um, or realizing them if it, if it was awarded. So uh, as I mentioned that when we did serve, we weren't expecting to hear anything, um, but we did actually receive a call, several calls in fact, from uh, the recipient uh, using rather uh, suspect names. We, we, we expected it was the, uh, the same person that kept ringing under different pseudonames and um, but refusing actually to give a proper address or, or telephone number. Uh, and that person uh, who went by the name of uh, John Smith on some occasions, Roger Brown on others, and even Adrian from the Electricity Board on one occasion, uh, he, he served a defense of sorts, but it wasn't really grounded in any kind of reality. Okay, and then and what happened next? Well, we served an application for summary judgment, uh, and that that's, means when the court can ma make a ruling without having a full trial, that it wasn't necessary. It's very, it's, it's used in cases of very clear cut infringement. Um, but the defendant actually did serve a witness statement under one of his pseudonames uh, with a statement of truth. Uh, but again, that had a very loose connection with the facts. And um, he, he did, he, when he contacted us, he said he'd turn up at the hearing um, and uh, four months after issue, as we waited in court for, for the summary judgment hearing application, we were waiting nervously to see whether anybody would turn up um, and he didn't in the end. So did you, did you get the court order? Uh, we did, we, we got a court order and um, uh, the defendant was required to uh, identify uh, who was behind the website and judgment for trademark infringement was entered in our client's favor. We also very importantly got the publicity notice which was really important to the client um, and that was an order to be published on the home page of the offending website um, just telling the world that on a certain date the judge made an order prohibiting the sale of these unauthorized certificates. We got an inquiry into damages too, um, and indemnity costs, although the judge did say at the hearing that uh, 
he didn't expect uh, we were likely to see those costs and uh, he was right. <laughs> so, so the defendant who you didn't know who it was, did he comply with the order? I, no. I think I probably know the answer. Yeah, but... No, he didn't. No, he didn't. But that was not unexpected. Um, what we, When we got that court order, we sent it to Nominet and enlisted its help to redirect the website, um, infringing website, to a page displaying the publicity notice. We also used the court order to inform the registrar uh, of the domain who put the domain on registrar lock and we publicised the win. Uh, we decided, we did obviously have an order for an inquiry into damages and costs, but uh, I think our client decided that they didn't want to do that any further because it was unlikely that uh, they were those, um, and it had already got what it wanted. So that was the end of the story? Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> there, were, um, there were several, uh, it, you know, he certainly tried the defendant. So there were, he, there were several ill-fated attempts by the defendant to appeal the judgment uh, with a whole load of excuses about where he was and why he didn't turn up at the hearing in the first place. Um, and he tried to represent himself uh, by telephone. And uh, the court was very, uh, when you've got litigant in person on the other side, the court, the court tried very hard to put the parties on an equal footing. And that, that's right, because you don't want to... Uh, you know, be prejudiced unduly um, if you haven't got the money to instruct lawyers. However, you know, it was clear that what he was doing was infringement and he'd been given every opportunity to identify himself, um, but he didn't. Uh, he had to take submissions by phone, but it didn't really go anywhere because the judge said if, he, if the defendant was unwilling to take the first step to identify himself, uh, well, then, uh, he, you know, if the, any appeal wasn't going to work. So it was really quite a strange case, really, Mark. Um, number of false starts at the beginning and twists and turns. But what it did illustrate was that you could get an order against persons unknown and use that order with the domain name authorities to permanently take down the website. And that's what happened. Excellent. Thanks. So just now, I think time to, to check with the audience if they've used any of those approaches that you've just discussed. So um, if we could have the second poll up and, and have you used any of any of have you used who is searches, private investigators, work with police or trading standards, etc. I have to say while people are voting that I do find the way that uh, the, the, the the inability to do who is searched properly anymore, very, very frustrating. And I'm not entirely, well, I'm, I'm entirely unconvinced that the approach they take is, is fairly based on the GDPR. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, what that shows is that we've got a, we've got a pretty broad range of all of those. And, and interesting that there's a couple of people out there who've also got court actions against unidentified defendants. So um, uh, that's interesting. And, and it'll be interesting to hear more about those perhaps, but um, thank you very much for everybody for that. That's, there's quite a lot of stuff being done there. Um, so Claire, intermediary liability. Um, yeah. That's another really interesting topic in, in, in this whole online infringement piece. Um, can you tell us, I mean, I know you've had a run in recently where intermediary liability was, was quite important. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've come across that issue in practice recently? Yeah, sure. I mean, that was another um, education example, actually. And um, people may be familiar with some of these sites. So we have university clients that have come across websites and, and they have nothing to do with the universities, but their students and students from universities around the world are encouraged to upload all kinds of documents to a central platform. And those documents are then accessible from, from that website, from that platform. And the documents that students are encouraged, um, incentivized in some cases to upload, can range from the university's examination papers uh, to students' notes of lectures, university lectures, to tutorials. And we've come across uh, a number of these websites, actually, at varying uh, levels of scale and um, sophistication. Um, some have organised dedicated pages for each uh, institution uh, with index sections for particular categories of documents. Uh, as some of the documents uploaded um, have, uh, have their university trademarks. Others carry university copyright notices. And in some cases, we've seen papers uploaded uh, which have warnings, examination papers, which have warnings on them not to remove them from the exam hall. So they're all 
all, they all kind of end up on the internet uh, uploaded by um, students. Okay, what's, what's the business model for these sites? Why, you know, why are they there and how do they exist? Well, I think it can vary, but some of the ones we have come across uh, where certain documents um, have been uploaded, certain ones are only available for download by other users uh, it, on a subscription basis. So that's the kind of model that they use to make money. Uh, and also they sell advertising space on, on the website. Okay. Um, I've got two undergraduate children who wouldn't see a problem with this. Um, what, what's the what's the university's objection to it? Yeah, I've also got a, a child <laughs> that, that uh, I think requires a bit of homeschooling re-education as well on the on the topic after having discussed it with her. But um, so many uh, many of the, the problem is obviously that many of the works that are uploaded are protected by copyright, and uh, that copyright often belongs to the university. Um, even where students uh, upload their own notes, it may be that the fresh layer of copyright is in their original works for, in relation to what they have done into those notes, but it may still infringe the underlying copyright belonging to the university from which they copy the notes from the board or, or uh, spoke, from sp spoken lectures. Now, um, the university uh, often incorporates third party ma in materials into its teaching material, and, that, and that's fine in that context because there is a, an exemption to copyright uh, infringement for education institutions. But, but that would be lost if the material is then subsequently used for commercial purposes. So that's the copyright side of it. And there's also a trademark side of it. So some of these websites that we have seen are just absolutely plastered with the logos of universities and, and all of those are used without the university's consent. And also some of the documents which are uploaded by students uh, frequently have the documents on them, whether that's exam papers or tutorials or the rest of it. Um, it's unlikely, uh, we think, that the statutory defences to trademark infringement would apply because these, these, um, they're not being used honestly or, or appropriately. And it's also not a very good start for, I know a lot of students do use these sites, but I would say it's not a great start uh, to a student's kind of life to start uh, to, to get involved in infringing uh, third party IP. And also on a kind of wider context for the universities, they spend a long time devising courses and derive their income that way. Uh, and they're put together very carefully. And whilst these websites, you know, quite a few students use them, they're no substitute for the real thing. Uh, and um, they may contain incomplete or out of date uh, or substandard documents, quite frankly. Um, what happens with a lot of these is that the platform operators actively encourage students by means of incentives to upload documents. They offer payment in some cases, if it's a, a university, a good university that they haven't um, got documents from, um, or free subscriptions to download other documents or enter them into prize drawers. Um, so in that way, they're really incentivizing students to submit materials that infringe third party IP. Okay, do they, um... Do these websites have any takedown procedures and, and, and how do they work? Yeah, well, if, the ones we have, work. yeah, well, the ones, well, that both, that both are good questions. So the ones we have come across do tend to have these takedown uh, procedures available, but uh, they don't actually work in practice or, or tend not to. And that, and that, when I was looking at the answers to the first poll, I think it was about, have people used takedown procedures? I was surprised at how few actually have, but actually trying to do it uh, and the barriers that are thrown in rights owners' ways make, make sense why perhaps some, some people don't do it. So what happens, for instance, uh, is that where you have got large scale infringement, um, if a takedown notice asks for the each and every URL of, of every document that you, we say uh, infringes rights, that, that itself, and there, there could be potentially thousands of documents, and there are on these student websites, that, um, and that itself acts as a barrier um, to uh, effective and proportionate enforcement of rights if you're required to list each and every URL. I don't know whether, Victor, you've come across a similar issue in relation to when you've done takedown notices. Um, um, yeah, a lot of our uh, URLs are either well, they're non-UK based. A lot of them are all overseas. It's, it's 
uh, these are the sort of uh, cases that I would refer to the net monitor that I uh, uh, was talking yeah. about, and they would yeah. deal with. It. I think um, either they get Google involved or they get uh, well. In this in the cases that we dealt with, they get Pipco involved. Yeah. yeah. And, and Claire, what what's the position of the owners of these platforms? Well, again, it varies. So sometimes it depends how sophisticated uh, they are. Really, these sites. So sometimes, if you send a letter before claim. Um, framed in copyright or trademark infringement they will cease all activity others have been a bit more obstinate actually and we have one based in Europe a provider much more more cha more challenging and and denied liability on the basis that they were merely passive uh, intermediaries and claimed immunity under the e-commerce directive um, but but in that directive there is a balance to be struck between the interests of IP owners and freedom of expression and creativity online so you're always trying to balance those two Okay, so these platforms are, are intermediaries. Um, I'd be interested to know what the audience think about intermediaries and their responsibility for the content that their platforms carry. So a, a final poll for the audience. Do you think that intermediaries should bear greater responsibility for content posted on their platforms? Um, and, and I have in mind here all sorts of platforms from Facebook to, to this sort of platform to some of the online, shop, uh, online shopping platforms. Um, providers and do you think intermediaries should bear greater responsibility for content on the platform once they know about the fact that illegal content or from information has been brought to their attention excellent I, I pretty strong views on the first one and even stronger views on the second one um great that's 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 really interesting thank you very much Clay, you mentioned the e-commerce directive um, yeah. and, and we know already that the EU is working on a revision to the e-commerce directive and that we talked earlier about the possibility of divergence early. It's, it's quite possible that EU and UK law will diverge on this point as soon as then on anything else. Um, so it, the e-commerce directive contains some exemptions for intermediaries and their yeah. liability. W which ones do they rely on? Well, the ones we've come across tend to rely on the hosting shield, which is Article 14 of the e-commerce directive. And those um, that, that uh, affects those who store the material uh, and those service providers are not liable for the information stored at the request of the recipient. But, but that's conditional and that's conditioned on the provider not, being, not having actual knowledge of the illegal activity or information or upon obtaining such knowledge to remove it, expeditiously remove or disable the information. And that's where the takedown uh, procedures come into play. Uh, it's without prejudice to the uh, possibility for national courts to require providers to remove stuff from the internet. There are also other exceptions, exemptions for mere conduits and caching websites. But basically, the recital at the beginning of the directive talks about um, exemptions from liability where there's mere technical automatic, uh, where the activity is of a mere technical, automatic or passive nature. Uh, and the courts ha have shown themselves willing to apply these principles beyond copyright. Yeah. So there's, there's the, the L'Oreal case there, isn't yeah. there? Yeah. yeah. Um, and are, are intermediaries therefore able to escape liability for infringement by invoking hosting shield? Well, in this particular, each case will turn on its own facts, and, and there is an often an argument as to what the whether the platform provider is passive or not. And in the case that I was talking about, about these students uploading all the all the um, copyright and and trademark information belonging to the university, um, fact indicators which. Uh, are relevant to assessing the intermediary's role are whether the students were um, incentivized to upload materials, whether in, in one of the cases that we dealt with that the intermediary only wanted uh, documents from students who went to certain universities. So there's a kind of quality check going on there that sometimes they quality check the material themselves, even if that was kind of done on an automated basis, they set the parameters of that automation. Um, grading of material as to how good it was and how it was organised and, and an editorial function in relation to the material uploaded. Okay, and I think I think there have been maybe some arguments in relation to copyright as well. Yeah, similar arguments about um, the mere provision of uh, physical facilities for enabling or making communication and whether that's a communication within the, the meaning of the directive. And I must say that I, I find it quite odd when, uh, when intermediaries do um, claim this uh, mere... Uh, um, passive nature when they also at the same time try to assert database rights over the materials that be, that's been uploaded. <laughs> yes, 
yes, that's an old, old argument to run. Um, so what can clients do about these sort of these sort of uh, platforms? Yeah, well, it really depends on on how active a role the intermediary is playing, the client's appetite for litigation, and the ability of the client to strike in a practical terms, pragmatic terms, an acceptable compromise with these intermediaries where the most egregious documents are removed um, and others you just have to live with or, or agree to live with. And, and sometimes they place a notice on the website explaining that it's not authorised or affiliated with a rights in any way. And the example which I gave you, this is an important education piece, I think, for students um, in relation to intellectual property rights and, and obviously other developments in, in this area of the law. Okay. In, so it's always, obviously, it's important to, to strike a balance between in rights holders' interests and platform operators. Um, isn't the level of freedom under review in the EU at the present time? And, and have we got any idea how the EU is going to go on that? And, and will that affect the UK? Yeah, well, the, there's, uh, there are proposals under the EU Copyright Directive which will impose additional requirements on the on passive intermediaries, whereby um, they seek to introduce an obligation on the operators to obtain authorization from rights holders for works uploaded by users. So that would address the problem that I was talking about with these student websites. But um, the, implement the implementation of the directive is, is actually not due until the middle of this year, which is too late for the UK, because left. Uh, and, and the government, the UK government has said it's not required to implement the directive and has no plans to do so. That said, it will have an impact on businesses that operate in the EU. And um, as, as to the e-commerce directive, some of it no longer applies to the UK, but the, the UK government has said it is still committed to upholding the liability protections. So for companies that host user generated content, uh, the notice and takedown procedure will remain. Uh, and that must mean that platforms must comply with it um, or, or risk liability. Okay. Um, so um, we've heard some real world examples of challenges dealing with, with infringers, counterfeit goods, copyright infringers, trademark infringers on, on, on the internet. Um, and before we open up to questions and, and we're, we're running slightly late and we're planning to, we'll make this very quick. I, just, just some top tips for, for dealing with online infringement. Victor, do you want to give us your top tips of dealing with online infringement? Uh, sure, Mark. Um, I guess identify and um, protect your IP from conception, as I mentioned. Um, be conscious of a budget, but um, avoid the thousand pricks death situation because everything single, I mean, the items may not be major or the quantity may be small, but you know, if you don't deal with it over time, it really can make a difference to your brand. And then I guess the last would be to keep abreast of developments in anti-counterfeiting technology and just to be aware of the infringement landscape. That's it. Brilliant. Thank you. Claire, what about yours? Very quick. Your three, your three as, bullet point top tips. Okay. Much the same as Victor. Register IP, monitor it and have a strategy of that for escalation. Fantastic. Brilliant. That's been really interesting. And, and, and actually what's been really interesting about it is two completely different types of case and, and a lot of the same, a lot of the same issues pulling through on on, on both of them. So um, we've got just just a few minutes left before we finish at uh, at uh, five o'clock. So um, Isabel, do we have any questions? We've probably got time for a couple of questions if we've got some coming through. Yeah, I could uh, raise a couple of questions. Um, Victor, could I uh, ask? you first uh with a business like yours ip is really important and do you find that as a the wider business is understanding about the needs you have to protect ip and um, defend against uh, infringement uh it's always a tricky question because management wants to see return on investment in most cases so obviously anything that in, they, they spend money on they want to see a return and for us it's quite difficult how do you actually quantify a success in IP, because if you don't see them on eBay, is that success? Um, perhaps, um, but some of them, they want more tangible. They want to see, okay, for a hundred, for a thousand pounds spent, perhaps you show me uh, 2000 items removed from eBay, that's it. Um, so yeah, it's a constant um, conversation and us persuading them that we need the money. And if you don't, you know, you don't give us, you probably, yeah, you see people buying less of your products. <laughs> And a, a similar question uh, for Claire, for you. Um, yeah. you, you've described some pretty complex procedural activity. Uh, so 
how easy is it do you find to be able to uh, estimate what the costs are going to be up front to stamp out this kind of activity? Well, I gave you, um, you know, quite an extreme example in relation to the fake certificates one, but there are lots of things, as I mentioned at the beginning, as to what you can do before you get to even issuing a letter before claim, you know, the action for the uh, try and, you know, contact the website owner if that doesn't work action fraud or, or things like that, or go to the host or registrar and get it taken down that way. But you really don't know at the outset how it's going to pan out. So I think um, uh, set a budget is what I would um, uh, what, what I would recommend uh, and have a series of steps of escalation and know, uh, know your limits really. You can, you can go on through as we did on our, on our one, uh, trying to um, issue proceedings ultimately against persons unknown and then get that kind of order. But that, that, as I say, is a pretty extreme one. There's lots of things you can do uh, at lower cost before you get to that point. Fantastic. Maybe just time for one more question, Isabel, if there is one. Well, very quickly, uh, Claire, if you're able to say anything about this, there's a question about uh, live blocking injunctions, which are sometimes uh, used, I know, in the UK courts. Could you do you know anything about that, that you can share with us very quickly? Yeah, well, there's the provision in the uh, Copyright Designs and Patents Act, which gives the High Court the power to grant an injunction against a service provider where that service provider has actual knowledge of another person using their, their service to infringe copyright. We've seen uh, a number of cases on these points. Uh, one of them was matchroom boxing, a recent one that came before Burst, I think, uh, where they tried to make an application to amend the order, although he thought it was a fresh order. Um, and, and that was an order to block live stream content. Um, uh, there are various, that was to do with boxing matches and um, it was an action against six internet service providers infringing match rooms who were a promotions company and Sky's uh, rights. Um, it, in those cases, there's pretty, uh, in that case, it sets out a form of order. So it's not an unusual thing to get now, but the, the things to bear in mind are proportionality, the right uh, not to impair the rights of ISPs to carry on a business uh, and they're time limited, these forms of order. Uh, and there are also confidentiality provisions. So as you're not teaching people how to circumvent uh, things in them. So that they are available. Uh, and um, I think the less trying to get them is less onerous than going through full blown trademark proceedings. Uh, but they are, again, the balance has to be maintained between uh, stopping this infringing content uh, and the rights of the ISP just to carry on a business. Brilliant. Thank you. I think it's, it's five o'clock on the dot. So thank you very much, Claire. Victor, thank you very much indeed for, as I said at the beginning, for, for taking the time to, to, to talk to us. It's been really fascinating. Okay. Um, and and I, I must admit, I was incredibly impressed by the extent to which some of those infringers had gone, particularly those, those, those infusing spoons. Thank you again for attending and have a very good evening. <laughs>